In this video, we continue on with the book titled The Chakras by C.W. Ledbetter. We're going to cover things about the life force, the serpent fire, the psychic forces, and so much more. I am Daisy and welcome to my channel. You are in my book playlist. In the previous video on the chakras, there was more of an orientation about what the chakras are, the main chakras, and their locations. Now, what are chakras? While in the East, such places as India, they've been familiar with the chakras for years, hundreds of years. Understanding the chakras as we understand the nervous system, for them it was just an additional part of the element of being human. In Discover Magazine, the article titled The Science Behind Your Chakras, they describe the chakras as transducers for subtle energy. And in Medical News Today, their article titled, What Are Chakras? Concept, Origins, and Effect on Health, there is an argument that there's no evidence that supports the existence of chakras in the spiritual sense. But then again, that's what they're talking about, science. So it's very hard because science and spirituality are trying to explain the same thing with different terms. That's my opinion. But in addition, they seem to have an argument whether sir, the chakras do correspond to physical body parts, particularly those in the nervous system. Again, it is my opinion that science and spirituality are trying to explain the same thing, but they're both arguing about the terminology. While I believe that in spirituality they're calling it chakras, or in the India it's known as chakras, here science has long understood that we have a various plexus throughout the nervous system. Now, I believe that science is trying to explain something that already spirituality understands, that these plexuses reign past the physical body and extend out beyond that. I personally have no argument with that because maybe you, some of you have had that experience where you feel that someone is looking at you. And with that, I will segue into chapter two, the forces. The primary or life force. The deity sends forth from himself various forms of energy. There may well be hundreds of which we know nothing, but some few of them have been observed. Each of these seen has its appropriate manifestation at every level which our students have yet reached. But for the moment, let us think of them as they show themselves in the physical world. One of them exhibits itself as electricity, another as the serpent fire, another as vitality, and yet another as the life force, which is quite a different thing from vitality, as will presently be seen. Patient and long-continued effort is needed by the student who would trace these forces to their origin and relate them to one another. At the time when I collected into the book The Hidden Side of Things, the answers to questions which had been asked during previous years at the roof meetings at IDR, I knew of the manifestation on the physical plane of the life force, of Kundalini, and of vitality, but not yet of their relation to the three outpourings, so that I describe them as entirely different and separate from them. Further research has enabled me to fill the gap, and I am glad now to have the opportunity of correcting the misstatement which I then made. There are three principal forces flowing through the chakras, and we may consider them as a representative of the three aspects of the Logos. The energy which we find rushing into the bell-like mouth of the chakra and setting up in relation to itself a secondary circular force is one of the expression of the second outpouring from the second aspect of the Logos. That stream of life which is sent out by him into the matter already vitalized by the action of the third aspect of the Logos in the first outpouring. It is this which is symbolized when it is said in Christian teaching that the Christ is incarnate of, that is, takes form from the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary. That second outpouring has long ago subdivided itself to an almost infinite degree. Not only has it subdivided itself, but it has also differentiated itself. That is to say, it seems to have done so. 
in reality, this is almost certainly only the maya or illusion through which we see it in action. It comes through countless millions of channels, showing itself on every plane and subplane of our system, and yet fundamentally, it is one and the same force. In no way for a moment to be confused with the first outpouring, which long ago manufactured the chemical elements from which this second outpouring takes the material of which its vehicle at all levels are built. It appears some of its manifestation were lower or denser because it is employing lower and denser matter. On the Buddhic level, we see it displaying itself as the Christ principle, gradually expanding and unfolding itself imperceptibly within the soul of the man. In the astral and mental bodies, we perceive that various layers of matter are vivified by it, so that we note different exhibitions of it appearing in the higher part of the astral in the guide of a noble emotion, and in the lower part of the very same vehicle as a mere rush of life force energizing the matter of that body. We find it in its lowest embodiment drawing round itself a veil of etheric matter, and rushing from the astral body into the flower-like bells of these chakras on the surface of the etheric part of the physical body. Here it meets another force welling up from the interior of the human body, the mysterious power called Kundalini, or the serpent fire. The serpent fire. This force is the physical plane manifestation of another of the manifold aspects of the power of the Logos, belonging to the first outpouring, which comes from the third aspect. It exists on all planes of which we know nothing, but it is the expression of it in etheric matter with which we have to do at present. It is not convertible into either the primary force already mentioned or the force of vitality which comes from the sun, and it does not seem to be affected in any way by any other forms of physical energy. I have seen as much as a million and a quarter volts of electricity put into a human body, so that when the man held out his arm towards the wall, huge flames rushed out from his fingers, yet he felt nothing unusual, nor would he be in the least burnt under these circumstances unless he actually touched some external object. But even this enormous display of power had no effect whatever upon the serpent fire. We have known for many years that there is deep down in the earth what may be described as a laboratory of the third logos. On attempting to investigate the conditions at the center of the earth, we find there a vast globe of such tremendous force that we cannot approach it. We can touch only its outer layers, but in doing even that, it becomes evident that they are in sympathetic relation with the layers of Kundalini in the human body. Into that center, the force of the third logos must have poured ages ago, but it is working there still. There he is engaged in the gradual development of new chemical elements, which show increasing complexity of form and more and more energetic internal life or activity. Students of chemistry are familiar with the periodic table originated by the Russian chemist Mendeleev in the latter part of the last century, in which the known chemical elements are arranged in the order of their atomic weights, beginning with the lightest, hydrogen, which has an atomic weight 1, and ending with the heaviest at present known, uranium, which has a relative weight of 238.5. In our own investigation into these matters, we found that these atomic weights were almost exactly proportional to the number of ultimate atoms in each element. We have recorded these numbers in the occult chemistry, and also the form and composition of each element. In most cases, the forms which we found when the elements were examined with etheric sight indicate, as does the periodic table also, that they do not lie on a straight line, but on an ascending spiral. We have been told that the elements hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen which constitute approximately half the crust of our globe and nearly all its atmosphere, belong at the same time to another and greater solar system, 
but we understand that the rest of the elements have been developed by the logos of our system. He is carrying on his spiral beyond uranium under conditions of temperature and pressure which are quite inconceivable to us. And gradually, as new elements are formed, they are pushed outwards and upwards towards the surface of the earth. The force of Kundalini in our bodies comes from that laboratory of the Holy Ghost deep down in the earth. It belongs to that terrific glowing fire of the underworld. That fire is in striking contrast to the fire of vitality which comes from the sun, which will presently be explained. The latter belongs to air and light and the great open spaces. But the fire which comes from below is much more material like the fire of red-hot iron, of glowing metal. There is a rather terrible side to this tremendous force. It gives the impression of descending deeper and deeper into matter, of moving slowly but irresistibly onwards with relentless certainty. The serpent fire is not that portion of the energy of the third logos with which he is engaged in building denser and denser chemical elements. It is more of the nature of a further development of that force which is in the living center of such elements as radium. It is part of the action of the life of the third logos after it has reached its lowest immersion and is once more ascending towards the heights from which it came. We have long understood that the second life wave from the second logos descends into matter through the first, second and third elemental kingdoms down to the mineral, and then ascends again through the vegetable and animal to the human kingdom, where it meets the downward-reaching power of the first logos. This is suggested in figure 3, in which the oval indicating the second outpouring comes down on the left side, reaches its densest point at the bottom of the diagram, and then rises again in the curve on the right-hand side of the figure. We now find that the force of the third logos also rises again after touching its lowest point. So we must imagine that the vertical line in the center of the figure returns upon its path. Kundalini is the power of that outpouring on its path of return and it works in the bodies of evolving creatures in intimate contact with the primary force already mentioned the two acting together to bring the creature to the point where it can receive the outpouring of the first logos and become an ego, a human being, and still carry on the vehicles even after that. We thus draw God's mighty power from the earth beneath as well as from the heaven above. We are children of the earth as well as of the sun. These two meet in us and work together for our evolution. We cannot have one without the other, but if one is greatly in excess, there are serious dangers. Hence, the risk of any development of the deeper layers of the serpent fire before the life in the man is pure and refined. We hear much of this strange fire and of the danger of prematurely arousing it, and much of what we hear is undoubtedly true. There is indeed most serious peril in awakening the higher aspects of this furious energy in a man before he has gained the strength to control it, before he has acquired the purity of life and thought which alone can make it safe for him to unleash potency so tremendous. But Kundalini plays a much larger part in daily life than most of us have hitherto supposed. There is a far lower and gentler manifestation of it which is already awake within us all, which is not only innocuous but beneficent, which is doing its appointed work day and night while we are entirely unconscious of its presence and activity. We have, of course, previously noticed this force as it flows along the nerves, calling it simply nerve fluid and not recognizing it for what it really is. The endeavor to analyze it and to trace it back to its source shows us that it enters the human body at the root chakra. Like all other forces, Kundalini is itself invisible. But in the human body, it clothes itself in a curious nest of hollow concentric spheres 
of astral and etheric matter, one within another, like the balls in a Chinese puzzle. There appear to be seven such concentric spheres resting within the root chakra, in and around the last real cell or hollow of the spine close to the cossacks, but only in the outermost of these spheres is the force active in the ordinary man. In the others it is sleeping, as it is said in some of the oriental books, and it is only when the man attempts to arouse the energy latent in those inner layers that the dangerous phenomena of the fire begin to show themselves. The harmless fire of the outer skin of the ball flows up the spinal column, using, so far as investigation have gone up to the present, the three lines of Sushumna, Ida, and Bingala simultaneously. The three spinal channels. Of these three currents which flow in and around the spinal cord of every human being, Madame Bavlatsky writes as follows in The Secret Doctrine. Quote, the Trans-Himalayan School locates Sushumna, the chief seat of these three nadis, in the central tube of the spinal cord. Ida and Pangala are simply the sharps and flats of that fa of human nature, which, when struck in a proper way, awakens the sentries on either side. The spiritual manas and the physical kama and subdues the lower through the higher. It is the pure akasha that passes up Sushumna. Its two aspects flow in Ida and Bingala. These are three vital airs and are symbolized by the Brahmanical thread. They are ruled by the will. Will and desire are the higher and lower aspects of one and the same. Hence the importance of the purity of the canals. From these three a circulation is set up and from the central canal passes into the whole body. Ida and Pingala play along the curved wall of the cord in which is Sumshumna. They are semi-material, positive and negative, sun and moon, and start into action the free and spiritual current of Sushumna. They have distinct paths of their own, otherwise they would radiate all over the body. End quote. In The Hidden Life in Freemasonry, I refer to a certain Masonic use of these forces as follows. It is part of the plan of Freemasonry to stimulate the activity of these forces in the human body in order that evolution may be quickened. The stimulation is applied at the moment when RWM creates, receives, and constitutes. In the first degree, it affects the Ida, or feminine aspect of the force, thus making it easier for the candidate to control passion and emotions. In the second degree, it is the Pingala, or masculine aspect which is strengthened in order to facilitate the control of mind. But in the third degree, it is the central energy itself, the Sushumna, which is aroused thereby opening the way for the influence of the pure spirit from on high. It is by passing up through this channel of the Sushumna that a yogi leaves his physical body at will in such a manner that he can retain full consciousness on higher planes and bring back into his physical brain a clear memory of his experiences. The little figures below give a rough indication of the way in which these forces flow through the human body. In a man, the Ida starts from the base of the spine, just on the left of the Sushumna, and the Bingala on the right, be it understood that I mean the right and left of the man, not the spectator. But in a woman, these positions are reversed. The lines end in the medulla oblongata. The spine is called in India the Brahmandanda, the stick of Brahma, and the drawing giving in figure 4D shows that it is also the original of the caduceus of Mercury, the two snakes of which symbolize the Kundalini or serpent fire which is presently to be set in motion along those channels, while the wings typify the power of conscious flight through higher planes which the development of that fire confers. Figure 4a shows the stimulated Ida. 
after the initiation into the first degree. This line is crimson in color. To it is added at the passing the yellow line of the Pingala, depicted in figure 4b. While at the raising, the series is completed by the deep blue stream of the Sushumna, illustrated by figure 4c. The Kundalini, which normally flows up these, is specialized during this upward passage and that in two ways. There is in it a curious mingling of positive and negative qualities which might almost be described as male and female. On the whole, there is a great preponderance of the feminine aspect, which is perhaps why in the Indian books this force is always spoken as she, also perhaps why a certain chamber in the heart, where Kundalini is centered in some forms of yoga, is described in The Voice of the Silence as the home of the world's mother. But when this serpent fire issues from its home in the root chakra and rises up the three channels, which we have mentioned, it is noteworthy that the section rising through the channel Pingala is almost wholly masculine, whereas that rising through the channel Ida is almost wholly feminine. The larger stream passing up the Sushumna seems to retain its original proportions. The second differentiation which takes place during the passage of this force up the spine is that it becomes intensely impregnated with the personality of the man. It seems to enter at the bottom as a very general force and to issue forth at the top as definitely this particular man's nerved fluid carrying with it the impress of his special qualities and idiosyncrasies which manifest themselves in the vibrations of those spine centers, which may be considered as the roots from which spring the stems of the surface chakras. The Marriage of the Forces Though the mouth of the flower-like bell of the chakra is on the surface of the etheric body, the stem of the trumpet-like blossom always springs from a center in the spinal cord. It is almost always to these centers in the spine, and not to the superficial manifestations of them, that the Hindu books refer when they speak of the chakras. In each case, an etheric stem, usually curving downwards, connects this root in the spine with the external chakra. See Plate 6. As the stems of all the chakras that start from the spinal cord, this force naturally flows down those stems into the flower bells where it meets the incoming stream of the divine life, and the pressure set up by the encounter causes the radiation of the mingled forces horizontally along the spokes of the chakra. The surfaces of the streams of the primary force and the kundalini grind together at this point, as they revolve in opposite directions and considerable pressure is caused. This has been symbolized as the marriage of the divine life, which is vividly male to the kundalini, which is always considered as distinctively feminine. And the compound energy which results is what is commonly called the personal magnetism of the man. It then vivifies the plexuses, which are seen in the neighborhood of several of the chakras. It flows along all the nerves of the body, and is principally responsible for keeping up its temperature. It sweeps along with it the vitality which has been absorbed and specialized by the spleen chakra. When the two forces combine, as mentioned above, there is a certain interlocking of some of the respective molecules. The primary force seems capable of occupying several different kinds of etheric form. That which it most commonly adopts is an octahedron made of four atoms arranged in a square with one central atom constantly vibrating up and down through the middle of the quadrilateral and at right angles to it. Footnote. The term atom used here and throughout the remainder of the book refers not to a chemical atom, but to the basic type of matter in the highest subplane of each plane of nature. Similarly, molecule refers to a grouping of such atoms in a way similar to that by which chemical atoms form chemical molecules. End of footnote. It also sometimes uses an exceedingly active little molecule, sometimes consisting of three atoms. The Kundalini usually clothes itself in a flat ring of seven atoms, while the vitality globule, which also consists of seven atoms, 
arranges them on a plan not unlike that of the primary force, except that it forms a hexagon instead of a square. Figure 5 may help the reader to image these arrangements. A and B are forms adopted by the primary force, C is that taken by the vitality globule, and D that of the kundalini. E shows the effect of the combination of A and D, F that of B and D. In A, B, and C, the central atom is all the time in a rapid vibration at right angles to the surface of the paper, springing up from it to the height greater than the diameter of the disc, and then sinking below the paper to an equal distance, but repeating this shuttle-like motion several times in a second. Of course, it will be understood that I speak relatively and not literally. In reality, the sphere which our disc represents is so tiny as to be invisible to the most powerful microscope. But in proportion to that size, its vibration is as I describe. In D, the only motion is a steady procession round and round the circle. But there is an immense amount of latent energy there, which manifests itself as soon as the combinations take place, which we have endeavored to illustrate in E and F. The two positive atoms in A and B continue when thus combined their previous violent activities. In fact, their vigor is greatly intensified. While the atoms in D, though they will still move along the same circular pathway, accelerate their speed so enormously that they cease to be visible as separate atoms and appear as a glowing ring. The first four molecules depicted above belong to the type to which, in occult chemistry, Dr. Bassant gives the name of hyper-meta-proto-elemental matter. Indeed, they may be identical with some of those which she drew for that book, but E and F being compounds must be taken as working upon the next subplane, which she calls the superetheric, and so would be classified as meta-proto-matter. Type B is far commoner than type A, and it naturally follows that in the nerve fluid, which is the final result of the confluence, we find many more examples of F and E. This nerve fluid is therefore a stream of various elements containing specimens of each one of the types shown in figure 4. Simple and compound, married and single, bachelors, old maids, and conjugal couples all rushing onward together. The marvelously energetic upward and downward movement of the central atom in the combinations E and F gives them a quite unusual shape within their magnetic fields as shown in figure 6. The upper half of this seems to me to bear a remarkable resemblance to the linga which is frequently to be seen in front of the temples of Shiva in India. I am told that the linga is an emblem of creative power and that Indian devotees regard it as extending downwards into the earth to just the same extent as it rises above it. I have wondered whether the ancient Hindus knew of this especially active molecule and of the immense importance of the part it plays in the support of human and animal life and whether they carved their symbol in stone as a record of their occult knowledge. The sympathetic system. Anatomists describe two nervous systems in the human body, the cerebrospinal and the sympathetic. The cerebrospinal begins with the brain, continues down the spinal cord, and ramifies to all parts of the body through the ganglia from which nerves issue between every two successive vertebrae. The sympathetic system consists of two cords which run almost the whole length of the spine, situated a little forward of its axis and to the right and left respectively. From the ganglia of these two cords, which are not quite as numerous as those of the spinal cord, sympathetic nerves proceed to form the network systems called the plexuses from which, in turn, as from relay stations, emerge smaller terminal ganglia and nerves. These two systems are, however, interrelated in a great variety of ways by so many connecting nerves 
that one must not think of them as two distinct neural organizations. In addition, we have a third group called the vagus nerves, which arise in the medulla oblongata and descend independently far into the body, mingling constantly with the nerves and plexuses of the other systems. The spinal cord, the left sympathetic cord, and the left vagus nerve are all shown in plate 6. It exhibits the nervous connections between the spinal and sympathetic ganglia and the channels by which the latter give forth nerves to form the principal plexuses of the sympathetic system. It will be noted that there is a tendency for the plexuses to droop from the ganglia in which they have their origin, so that, for example, the celiac or solar plexus depends largely upon the great splanchnic nerve, known in outer plate as rising from the fifth thoracic sympathetic ganglion, which in turn is connected with the fourth thoracic spinal ganglion. This is almost on a level with the heart horizontally, but the nerve descends and joins the smaller and the smallest splanchnic nerves, which merge from lower thoracic ganglia, and these pass through the diaphragm and go to the solar plexus. There are also other connections between that plexus and the cords, shown in the plate to some extent, but too complicated to describe. The principal nerves leading to the cardiac plexus bend downwards in a similar manner. In the case of the pharyngeal plexus, there's but a slight droop, and the carotid plexus even rises upward from the internal carotid nerve, coming from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. The centers in the spine. There is a somewhat similar droop in the etheric stem which connects the flowers or chakras on the surface of the etheric double with their corresponding centers in the spine, which are situated approximately in the positions shown in red on plate 6 and detailed in table 2. The radiating spokes of the chakras supply force to these sympathetic plexuses to assist them in their relay work. In the present state of our knowledge, it seems to me rash to identify the chakras with the plexuses, as some writers appear to have done. The hypogastric or pelvic plexus are no doubt connected in some way with the Svadhisthana chakra, situated near the generative organs, which is mentioned in Indian books but not used in our scheme of development. The plexuses grouped together in this region are probably largely subordinate to the solar plexus in all matters of conscious activity, as both they and the splenic plexus are connected very closely with it by numerous nerves. The crown chakra is not connected with any of the sympathetic plexuses of the physical body, but is associated with the pineal gland and the pituitary body, as we shall see in chapter 4. It is related also to the development of the brain and spinal system of nerves. On the origin and relations of the sympathetic and cerebrospinal systems, Dr. Annie Besant writes as follows in a study in consciousness. Quote, Let us see how the building of the nervous system by vibratory impulses from the astral begins and is carried on. We find a minute group of nerve cells and tiny processes connecting them. This is formed by the action of a center which has previously appeared in the astral body, an aggregation of astral matter arranged to form a center for receiving and responding to impulses from outside. From that astral center, vibrations pass into the etheric body, causing little etheric whirlpools which draw into themselves particles of denser physical matter, forming at last a nerve cell and groups of nerve cells. These physical centers, receiving vibrations from the outer world, send impulses back to the astral centers, increasing their vibrations. Thus, the physical and the astral centers act and react on each other and each becomes more complicated and more effective. As we pass up the animal kingdom, we find the physical nervous system constantly improving and becoming a more and more dominant factor in the body, and the first formed system becomes, in the vertebrates, the sympathetic system, controlling 
and energizing the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the digestive tract. Beside, it slowly develops the cerebrospinal system, closely connected in its lower workings with the sympathetic and becoming gradually more and more dominant, while it also becomes in its most important development the normal organ for the expression of the waking consciousness. This cerebral spinal system is built up by impulses originating in the mental, not in the astral plane, and is only indirectly related to the astral through the sympathetic system built up from the astral. End of quote. Vitality. We all know the feeling of cheerfulness and well-being which sunlight brings to us, but only students of occultism are fully aware of the reasons for that sensation. Just as the sun floods his system with light and heat, so does he perpetually pour out into it another force as yet unsuspected by modern science. A force to which has been given the name vitality. This is radiated on all levels and manifests itself in each realm, physical, emotional, mental, and the rest. But we are especially concerned for the moment with its appearance in the lowest where it enters some of the physical atoms, immensely increases their activity, and makes them animated and glowing. We must not confuse this force with electricity, though it in some ways resembles it, for its action differs in many ways from that of either electricity, light, or heat. Any of the variants of this latter force cause oscillation of the atom as a whole, an oscillation the size of which is enormous as compared with that of the atom. But this other force, which we call vitality, comes to the atom not from without, but from within. The Vitality Globule The atom is itself nothing but the manifestation of a force. The solar deity wills a certain shape, which we call an ultimate physical atom. And by that effort of his will, some 14,000 million bubbles in Coilon are held in that particular form. It is necessary to emphasize the fact that the cohesion of the bubbles in that form is entirely dependent upon that effort of will, so that if that were for a single instant withdrawn, the bubbles must fall apart again, and the whole physical realm would simply cease to exist in far less than the period of a flash of lightning. So true is it that the world is nothing but illusion. Even from this point of view, to say nothing of the fact that the bubbles of which the atom is built are themselves only holes in Coilin, the true ether of space. So it is the will force of the solar deity continually exercised which holds the atom together as such. And when we try to examine the action of that force, we see that it does not come into the atom from outside, but it wells up within it which means that it enters it from higher dimensions. The same is true with regard to this other force, which we call vitality. It enters the atom from within, along with the force that holds that atom together, instead of acting upon it entirely from without. As do those other varieties of force, which we call light, heat, or electricity. When vitality wells up, Thus, within an atom, it endows it with an additional life and gives it a power of attraction so that it immediately draws round its six other atoms, which it arranges in a definite form, thus making a subatomic or hypermeta proto element, as I have already explained. But this element differs from all others which have so far been observed in that the force which creates it and holds it together comes from the first aspect of of the solar deity instead of from the third. These globules are conspicuous above all others which may be seen floating in the atmosphere. On account of their brilliance and extreme activity, the intensely vivid life which they show. These are probably the fiery lives so often mentioned by Madame Bavlatsky, as for example in The Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, page 306, where she writes, quote, we are taught that every physiological change, nay, life itself, or rather the objective phenomena of life, 
produced by certain conditions and changes in the tissues of the body, which allow and force life to act in that body, that all this is due to those unseen creators and destroyers, which are called, in such a loose and general way, microbes. It might be supposed that these fiery lives and the microbes of science are identical. This is not true. The fiery lives are the seventh and highest subdivision of the plane of matter and correspond in the individual with the one life of the universe, though only on the plane of matter. End quote. While the force that vivifies these globules is quite different from light, it nevertheless seems to depend upon light for its power of manifestation. In brilliant sunshine, this vitality is constantly welling up afresh, and the globules are generated with great rapidity and in incredible numbers. But in cloudy weather, there is a great diminution in the number of globules formed, and during the night, so far as we have been able to see, the operation is entirely suspended. In the night, therefore, we may be said to be living upon the stock manufactured in the course of previous days, and though it appears practically impossible that it should ever be entirely exhausted, that stock evidently does run low when there is a long succession of cloudy days. The globule, once charged, remains as a subatomic element and is not subject to any change or loss of force unless and until it is absorbed by some living creature. The Supply of Globules Vitality, like light and heat, is pouring forth from the sun continually, but obstacles frequently arise to prevent the full supply from reaching the earth. In the wintry and melancholy climes miscalled the temperate, it too often happens that for days together the sky is covered by a funeral pall of heavy cloud. And this affects vitality just as it does light. It does not altogether hinder its passage, but sensibly diminish its amount. Therefore, in dull and dark weather, vitality runs low, and overall, living creatures there comes in instinctive yearning for sunlight. When vitalized, atoms are thus more sparsely scattered. The man in rude health increases his power of absorption, depletes a larger area, and so keeps his strength at the normal level. But invalids and men of small nerve force who cannot do this often suffer severely and find themselves growing weaker and more irritable without knowing why. For similar reasons, vitality is at a lower ebb in the winter than in the summer. For even if the winter day be sunny, which is rare, we have still to face the long and dreary winter night, during which we must exist upon such vitality as the day has stored in our atmosphere. On the other hand, the long summer day, when bright and cloudless, charges the atmosphere so thoroughly with vitality that its short night makes but little difference. From the study of this question of vitality, the occultist cannot fail to recognize that, quite apart from temperature, sunlight is one of the most important factors in the attainment and preservation of perfect health, a factor for the absence of which nothing else can entirely compensate. Since this vitality is poured forth not only upon the physical world, but upon all others as well, it is evident that, when in other respects satisfactory conditions are present, emotion, intellect, and spirituality will be at their best under clear skies and with the inestimable aid of the sunlight. Psychic Forces The three forces already mentioned, the primary, the vitality, and the kundalini are not directly connected with man's mental and emotional life, but only with his bodily well-being. But there are also forces entering the chakras which may be described as psychic and spiritual. The first two centers exhibit none of these, but the navel chakra and the others higher in the body are ports of entry for forces which affect human consciousness. In an article on thought centers in the book, The Inner Life, I explained that masses of thought are very definite things, occupying a place in space. 
thoughts on the same subject and of the same character tend to aggregate. Therefore, for many subjects, there is a thought center, a definite space in the atmosphere, and other thoughts about the same matter are attracted to such a center and go to increase its size and influence. A thinker may in this way contribute to a center, but he in turn may be influenced by it. And this is one of the reasons why people think in droves like sheep. It is much easier for a man of lazy mentality to accept a ready-made thought from someone else than to go through the mental labor of considering the various aspects of a subject and arriving at a decision for himself. This is true on the mental plane with regard to thought. And with appropriate modifications, it is true on the astral plane with regard to feeling. Thought flies like lightning through the subtle matter of the mental plane. So the thought of the whole world on a certain subject may easily gather together in one spot and yet be accessible and attractive to every thinker on that subject. Astral matter, though so far finer than physical, is yet denser than that of the mental plane. The great clouds of emotion forms which are generated in the astral world by strong feelings do not all fly to one world center, but they do coalesce with other forms of the same nature in their own neighborhood. So that enormous and very powerful blocks of feeling are floating about almost everywhere, and a man may readily come into contact with them and be influenced by them. The connection of this matter with our present subject lies in the fact that when such influence is exercised, it is through the medium of one or other of the chakras. To illustrate what I mean, let me take the example of a man who is filled with fear. Those who have read the book Man Visible and Invisible will remember that the condition of the astral body of such a man is shown in plate 14. The vibrations radiated by an astral body in that state will at once attract any fear clouds that happen to be in the vicinity. If the man can quickly recover himself and master his fear, the clouds will roll back sullenly, but if the fear remains or increases, they will discharge their accumulated energy through his umbilical chakra and his fear may become mad panic in which he altogether loses control of himself and may rush blindly into any kind of danger. In the same way, one who loses his temper attracts clouds of anger and renders himself liable to an inrush of feeling which will change his indignation into manical fury, a condition in which he might commit murder by an irresistible impulse almost without knowing it. Similarly, a man who yields to depression may be swept into a terrible state of permanent melancholia, or one who allows himself to be obsessed by animal desire may become for the time a monster of lust and sensuality, and may under the influence commit crimes the thought of which will horrify him when he recovers his reason. All such undesirable currents reach the man through the navel chakra. Fortunately, there are other and higher possibilities. For example, there are clouds of affection and of devotion, and he who feels these noble emotions may receive through his heart chakra a wonderful enhancement of them, such as is depicted in Man Visible and Invisible in Plates 11 and 12. The kind of emotion which affects the navel chakra in the manner before mentioned is indicated by Dr. Besant's A Study in Consciousness where she divides the emotions into two classes, those of love and those of hate. All those on the side of hate work in the navel chakra, but those on the side of love operate in the heart. She writes, quote, We have seen that desire has two main expressions, desire to attract in order to possess, or again to come into contact with, any object which has previously afforded pleasure, desire to repel in order to drive far away or to avoid contact with any object which has previously inflicted pain. We have seen that attraction and repulsion are the two forms of desire, swaying the self. Emotion, being desire infused with intellect, inevitably shows the same division into two. 
The emotions which is of the nature of attraction, attracting objects to each other by pleasure, the integrating energy in the universe is called love. The emotion which is of the nature of repulsion, driving objects apart from each other by pain. The disintegrating energy in the universe is called hate. These are the two stems from the root of desire, and all the branches of the emotions may be traced back to one of these twain. Hence, the identity of the characteristics of desire and emotions, love seeks to draw to itself the attractive object or to go after it in order to unite with it, to possess or to be possessed by it. It binds by pleasure, by happiness, as desire binds. Its ties are indeed more lasting, more complicated, are composed of more numerous and more delicate threads interwoven into greater complexity. But the essence of desire attraction, the binding of two objects together, in the essence of emotion attraction, of love. And so also does hate seek to drive from itself the repellent object or to flee from it in order to be apart from it, to repulse or be repulsed by it. It separates by pain, by unhappiness. And thus, the essence of desire repulsion, the driving apart of two objects, is the essence of emotions repulsion, of hate. Love and hate are the elaborated and thought-infused forms of the simple desires to possess, and to shun. End quote. Later on, Dr. Besant explains that each of these two great emotions subdivides into three parts according as the man who has it feels strong or weak. Quote, Love looking downwards is benevolence. Love looking upwards is reverence. And these are the several common characteristics of love from superiors to inferiors and from inferiors to superiors universally. The normal relations between husband and wife and those between brothers and sisters afford us the field for studying the manifestation of love between equals. We see love showing itself as mutual tenderness and mutual trustfulness as consideration, respect, and desire to please as quick insight into and endeavor to fulfill the wishes of the other, as magnanimity, forbearance. The elements present in the love emotions of superior to inferior are found here, but mutuality is impressed on all of them. So we may say that the common characteristics of love between equals is desire for mutual help. Thus, we have benevolent desire for mutual help and reverence as the three main divisions of the love emotion, and under these all love emotions may be classified. For all human relations are summed up under the three classes, the relations of superiors to inferiors, of equals to equals, of inferiors to superiors. End quote. She then explains the hate emotions in the same way. Quote, Hate looking downwards is scorn, and looking upwards is fear. Similarly, hate between equals will show itself in anger, combativeness, disrespect, violence, aggressiveness, jealousy, insolence, etc. All the emotions which repel men from man when they stand as rivals, face to face, not hand in hand. The common characteristic of hate between equals will thus be mutual injury. And three main characteristics of the hate emotion are scorn, desire for mutual injury, and fear. Love is characterized in all its manifestations by sympathy, self-sacrifice, the desire to give. These are its essential factors, whether as benevolence, as desire for mutual help, as reverence. For all these directly serve attraction, bring about union, are of the very nature of love. Hence love is of the spirit, for sympathy is the feeling for another as one would feel for oneself. Self-sacrifice is the recognition of the claim of the other as oneself. Giving is the condition of spiritual life. Thus love is seen to belong to spirit, to the life side of the universe. Hate, on the other hand, is characterized in all its manifestations by antipathy, 
self-aggrandizement, the desire to take. These are its essential factors, whether as scorn, desire for mutual injury, or fear. All these directly serve repulsion, driving one apart from another. Hence, hate is of matter, emphasizes manifoldness and differences, is essentially separateness, belongs to the form side of the universe. End of quote. End of chapter. Lots of golden nuggets here. If there's anything that stood out for you, leave a comment. Let me know you were here. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and head over to the next video for more.